So I'm here as um, someone just to open with some questions. Stephen and I have worked together on exhibitions at the Met where I have been involved because I'm the curator, was, I'm now emeritus, uh, the curator for the East Christian world and the, the Jewish community, which is part of that world, and we've been very careful and deliberate to include that in the exhibitions I did. So I, have, I know Stephen's views of this from what I've studied with him and learned from him over now a number of years. And the Samaritans have always been something he's been incredibly interested in. And so I've known about his development of the exhibition before about the film, but what I find so incredible about the film you've done is you got them to open up about things that were incredibly private and things that, how did they trust you not to present it in a way that they would feel embarrassed or angry about? You should ask this question then. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's a long process. It's a long process. When I when I start to speak with them, um, I get closer to them very gently and and slowly, slowly. And I I told them what I want to to do is to hear your story, not my story. I don't want to tell my point of view. I want to try as I can to bring your point of view, your story, your faith to the screen. And of course, your challenge, how to save your community. Because we really have a chance to meet this community in a kind of, uh, let's say, crossroad. Um, 30 Russian women to 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 get, uh, to let them in to a so small community in a 10 15 years from now will completely change the, the community you can uh, we put some footage at the last part of the movie that you can see here and there blonde kids so this is the visual change, but those people who are used to speak Arabic, Hebrew, they will start to speak Russian or Ukraine. <laughs> and it's not just a language or, or, or uh, how they look. The culture will change. The, how, how do you say, tfisat olam. The <laughs> the word you will change because you bring to an Arab Eastern community European people, and uh, I came as a religious pe person, so it's much more easy to speak um, religious person to another religious person. For example, when I whenever I came. I came to Mount Grizim to visit them or to 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 film. I um, keep an hour, an hour or an hour and a half to stay with Chefetz, not to visit him, to learn to learn with him Torah. We are speaking like we are sitting together at the same Beit Midrash, so they know that they trust me because they know that I'm a kind of part of them. And I already told them, they asked me, why you are coming and follow, uh, and uh, uh, why you are coming and follow, follow us so long time? Okay, people coming, shooting few months, doing a documentary and they're going. I said, when I meet you at the first time, I feel like I met my grand, 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 grand parents. Because you are, I feel that you are keeping the, let's say, a kind of the original version of the Torah. And you are Eastern like my parents, and the vibe is like my parents, so I feel like I met my roots. And uh, 
I told them it's for me it's uh, I look at the Samaritan as a kind of a time capsule it's a chance to meet our roots Steve and I'm going to kill me <laughs> <laughs> why do you say that why because usually I'm using to say when I'm when I when I speak to um, religious uh, people I said uh, religious uh, Jewish people I said you know that we are not keeping Torah. We are not observing Torah? No. We are observing Shulchan Aruch. They keeping the Torah. And, and then I look at him and say, the Samaritans have just as complex and interesting as development as Jews do. It's just a parallel development. Sort of like those people who know Star Trek lore, right? <laughs> there's, there's the mirror universe where they're almost like us, kind of like us, and then you say, oh, that's different. And that's where I sort of tune in to those distinctions. And so this conversation we've been having since the minute we decided to do this movie has been um, a 24 hour, seven day a week turnaround between Moshe and Mount Greasy. I remember the day that Moshe sent me an email, I'm getting the Abisha scroll. I said, go get the Abisha scroll. I can't get the Abisha scroll. I get a message, I'm touching the Abisha scroll. You can't be, I'm not there. How can you be doing this without me? <laughs> and we're in the middle of COVID and we're going back and forth between continents with my students looking things up and his film people doing their thing and the two of us figuring it out. And it's been this amazing attempt to understand people who are the hardest people to understand, the ones that are kind of like us. It's really to, easy to understand people who are real different. But these are the people that, oh yeah, it's Passover. Happy Passover. What are you doing there? Right? Um, and so for the two of us, because look, I, I'm Yeshiva University and Moshe lives his life in Israel. And this isn't the project you expected us to do at YU. And it's been taken by our community by two hands as a place to talk about complex and interesting things. Um, these human beings, whom I don't know if you saw it in the film, every single person has a name. Uh, in our exhibition, which is at the Museum of the Bible right now and then it's going to Germany, every human being on the walls has a name. There's no such thing as the Samaritans. There's Najah, and there's Brito, isn't he cute? And there's... Um, all those other people, and standing behind them, every so often you hear, hi Moshe, or Moshe asked the hard question, because the person who's off stage all the time is sitting right over there, and he's in the film everywhere. So. And your, question, your questions in the film are, are really quite fascinating, um, and they move it forward, because it does move forward in a way like a novel. We're, we're both following the survival of a, of a community in a religious sense, but we're also watching individuals as they cope with being part of the survival and uh, also want to be their own, their own selves. And, and the Ukrainian <laughs> Orthodox women, I now wonder who, whether they report to Moscow or to um, Istanbul in terms of the hierarchy of the church they left. Um, that they would choose to come and that they, the ones you interviewed at least are, have moved into it. And that seems to be an issue of the role of women in that community is something that reminds me strongly of the 19th century and if not earlier. Um, how did you choose to put so much emphasis on that in the film? Or is that a fair question? <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right, so I'll start the answer and you continue it, okay? Okay. Okay. In dealing with the Samaritans, it's really hard to get the voice that isn't the priest, right? And isn't the guys who do all the sacrificing and all of that. Um, when we did the exhibition or with the movie, we could go through 150 photographs before we found a woman to put in our exhibition and our book. It was not easy, but we were both aware that we wanted to break that sort of 
language and, and create some sort of balance in a world where there is no balance. And so I remember the day that Moshe called me up and said, I have an idea. All right, now it's your turn. <laughs> it's a community. Community have inside men and women, like all over the world. But this community are um, Eastern, a, a religious, old uh, tradition. So officially, women don't have an official duty during the year. But they have a very important um, duties behind the scene. You heard what Brito said. Yes, but the committee that uh, woman did uh, behind the, the 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 curtain to match peop to to match guys and and girls and and cetera and cetera. And I know if I'm doing a documentary film, not for the community, and for the whole world, the first question will be, where is the woman? So we decide to give the official microphone to the woman. So not the men will explain, not the men will take us to their um, experience, what they feel when they are doing the, um, the ceremony, the, the Zevach Pesach, the, the sacrifice of, uh, of, the, of the Pesach. So we decide to um, have the woman as um, talking heads, but it's not a talking heads. The it's hard talk. So thanks God we succeed to do it. <laughs> Can I add something about that? Of course. Look, you, you look at this and you see the Samaritan women, but you don't see the Samaritan woman who is a principal in Nablus, and you, don't, and you saw Ronit Sadaka, who makes her own music videos, um, and uh, Benny Tadaka's mother on the painting in his room, who was a principal in Tel Aviv and a, a major person in the educational system in Israel, um, whether within the Nablus group or within the Cologne group, we're dealing with a community with, which has developed a very powerful cadre of women from the very start of the 20th century. Um, but there's no language for that within the community to express that power. If you saw some of the stuff that we didn't use in the film, you would, see, you would have seen the women of the community saying, Moshe, this is impossible. We have to do X and the Y and Z for the purpose of the community. But that doesn't have a place when the priest is up here, right, the high priest, and then there's this co the, the cantor, and there's all the other priests on the council, and they're all men. And if you're not a priest, you're not in those power positions, unless, of course, you're in Tel Aviv, where the non-priests generally run the show. In other words, it's all male, un except it's not. And that's what Moshe was able to bring out so wonderfully. Were they happy? I, I understand that they were happy with the film, which means that they were happy with you having the women of the community, in a way, speak for them when they are used of to course. speaking for themselves. Yes, yes. They're happy with that. And I'm waiting in, in uh, December 18, the whole community are going to come to Jerusalem to watch the movie. Uh, uh, since now, just, um, let's say, five or ten. Or less. Or, l yeah, f um, approximately five people from the com from the Samaritan community watched the film. Um, uh, Ronit watched it with her husband just to say to 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 see if I didn't uh, make mistake, and Benny and uh, Yefet and uh, Najah. That's all. Mm. But I'm sure they will be happy. <laughs> well, it's a very lovely film. Right. It, you feel drawn into it, or I do. I, I speak for all of you, so you can ignore me. Um, what, what? But you feel drawn into the film, and you don't feel, I don't know, it, when, we, when we met briefly, it, it's not like a, 
National Geographic or BBC look at these people and this is what they are doing, no, which is a very traditional form of scholarship. You skip that and, and step into it. I find it just incredibly powerful. I, I, each time when I uh, uh, sitting in the uh, crowd who watched the film, I surprise w where people are laughing. <laughs> It's uh, definitely um, a um, culture question, <laughs> and um, okay, <laughs> Stephen. So for those of you, for those of you who maybe don't know, the exhibition is actually on the early history of the Samaritans, and that's how. Stephen was to, or, or began in that way, the conversations I remember. Um, and it's blossomed into being such a um, survey of a people over all time. And so we, we're, we're looking back, and I'm an art historian, so I was sitting there trying to figure out what date the, the covers on the Torahs were made. 1540. And Okay, um, <laughs> <laughs> give or take. Um, but it's, it's and, and I, I just love that Rockefeller's name was on one of them. <laughs> uh, I, I started doing Japanese art and the story for the woman that taught me was that when she was in Japan right after World War II that the priests that let her look at uh, the incredibly famous paintings they had said to her when she was thinking, this man doesn't know what he's done for me. He's such a pure spiritual figure. And he's saying, the Rockefellers were here last week and we didn't let them see them. Um, <laughs> so they could raise it out. Why were the Rockefellers interested? Do you know? We, you know what? I think what happened was this. They made the book for the Rockefellers. It was there was a teacher sent by the Jewish agency. This is a great story. And in a lot of ways, the Samaritans exist today because the Zionist movement took an interest in them, uh, down to the point that under Jordanian rule, when they were truly starving, um, the state of Israel sent uh, funds through the Joint Distribution Committee and the Red Cross to make sure that they didn't starve. Um, the second president of Israel, we saw in the film, uh, Yitzhak ben Svi became a great Samaritan scholar and supporter of the community in every possible way. He's, he's like their patron saint in, in many ways, and everybody knows it. And so, uh, for example, we have in the exhibition a stone from a Samaritan synagogue from the Middle Ages on Mount Grizim that sits at the president's house in Jerusalem. And what do you know, the president of Israel made a film to, to tell us how happy he was that he has a relationship with the Israeli president and then with the Samaritans, and he could send the stone to our exhibition. There's this very close relationship um, with the Zionist movement. It's something to be truly proud of, that this tiny dying group in 1900 has, you know, it may only fill two 747s, but that's a lot more than filling one 727, you know? Um, there's a lot more of them than there were, and, and they're thriving in ways that no one would have expected in the 19th century, um, which I hope that our project, aside for letting them look at themselves through our eyes and us looking at ourselves through their eyes and our exhibitions and our books and our cookbook, all of these things together will bring a sort of another conversation that our world includes Jews and it includes Christians and it includes Muslims and it includes Samaritans with a 3,000 year old literature um, who are interesting people. Uh, I remember the first time Moshe and I sat down to talk about this. Um, he called me when he wasn't supposed to because I put out a call for you know, filmmakers through the new fund and he wasn't supposed to contact me, but the Samaritans sent him. And so we're sitting in a coffee house and he said, we can't do a history movie. Like he doesn't know who academics are. <laughs> we can't do a history <laughs> money, <laughs> right? Or maybe he does, right? I said, no, we can't. We're doing the history in the exhibition. We don't have to do it here. Whatever they say is the truth. I said, yeah. We're going to look them right in the eye. And I said, yeah, that's my attitude too. <laughs> and the, it, it, from that second, the question was how to manipulate, don't tell them, the, uh, the funding company so that he would get the contract. 
right? Because it was clear to me that to do the Samaritans meant not doing your average kind of movie where you go in for three weeks or three months. And we've been in it for six years. And you could feel it. We want to take some questions from the audience. OK. So the first hand that went up was <laughs> straight back. <laughs> I thought this was a fabulous, fascinating story, something that I was not personally aware of. Um, my question, I was taken aback by how eloquently these people spoke Hebrew. And we saw the youngsters learning the sacred text. But what does the, how does their education compare to, say, that of you know, the secular schooling of Israelis. And the second part of the question, how, does, how do the Samaritans in Hulon compare to the ones in Samaria and the First of all, West the ones Bank? in Hulon are Israeli in every way. So there is no... Including the IDF. Including the, the IDF, IDF, including Israeli secular schools. Oh my and God. they go to Hebrew school in the afternoon. The, the, the um, Samaritan who live in, uh, in Hulon serving the IDF, in some very, very, very secret unit. The Samaritan who live in Mount Grizim definitely cannot serve the army because their life is in Nablus. So it's danger for them to hang around in Nablus as a, as a Israeli soldier. Brothers, well, they're, they're cousins. They're together all the time. Yeah. Look, it, uh, in 1966, the Jordanians stopped letting the Israelis cross the border for Pesach because, you know, it was 20 years since the founding of the state. That means a lot of little boys were now soldiers. And the Jordanians realized they were letting a bunch of Israeli soldiers over the border for Passover. And so they stopped letting, the, and it was a tragedy. They didn't know what to do with themselves. Uh, after 67, um, the, the people, the, the group in um, Cologne, which had the ear of the government and had funding from the government, um, sent the leadership on Mount Grizim to Ulpan Akiva, Netanya, number one, to learn Hebrew. And so um, there's been this constant interface. They live on top of the mountain because during the first intifada, they were being butchered on the bottom of the mountain, and the Israeli government helped them build a yeshuv on top of the mountain, maybe the only yeshuv that many people like, right? In other words, they built themselves a neighborhood on top of the mountain as a sense of, of, uh, imp of being, uh, being um, saved. Because in the city, uh, life wasn't always so good to be a Samaritan who works for the Israeli taxation office, as we see. The cantor's wife's face was, was destroyed with uh, acid because she worked in Beg Kapoalim in Ablus. And so we're dealing with real complexity at the most basic level um, for, for everybody. In other words, if we think that we live complexity, these people are living it on steroids. The, uh, you know, they're not Jews and they're not Arabs, but they're Israelites and they're Palestinians, but they're not Palestinians and they're Israelis and on and on and on. And welcome to the modern world Pal uh, Samaritans, you know? Um, I, I have a question here. I was really shocked to see the section on, I forget the, the Samaritan word, nida, men, menstrual cycle. I was really shocked to see how strictly that was enforced. And when the women talked about it, they didn't talk about it like they were in prison. They said, no, you know, we, we, we just can't touch people. We can't do this. We can't do that. But in this day and age, to enforce Nida like that, I found totally shocking. And I, I found it 19th century. Um, I, 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 19th century? What do you mean by that? I, it, it seems to me that the 19th century was probably the last time things like that were widespread, and we moved past it in much of the world, but there are always pockets that haven't. From my point of view, some of the things that we were looking at, um, you can find in the Catholic Church, um, you can find in, in Hinduism, it, 
it, they're, they're kind of universal problems. And yes, I, but then I also always wonder, the people you interviewed, are they the ones that are doing the rules the most? And not everybody is doing them quite as intensely. I can't, I do not know these people, so I can't speak for them beyond the way they spoke for themselves. And, and it, I, I found it surprising they were willing to discuss it so much. Most of, most of the women keep them some a day very strictly. It's very important. It's one of the Shabbat, Kippur, and Samadeh, they are the basic of this uh, uh, religious. Uh, and I knew that when this film will shown all over the world, people will say about them Samadeh, about the Badal, how they dare, the woman. And I feel like you, when I first heard it, and then I remind myself that I'm not coming to tell my story. I come to hear their story. So I must respect them. Of course, you, I, I, I will feel or I heard that the women suffer. And no, that's, the, that's their religious. That's the way how they choose to worship God. So I respect that. And I give them the microphone and the lens of the camera to, to hear them, to experience what they feel. And you see that they said, at the first, you hear, yeah, it's wonderful. They serve us food. And, and then between the lines, you can hear that there is part hard with that. But that's life. But you know, when you show the film to an Orthodox Jewish group, it's about degrees because the Orthodox Jewish community also deals with menstruation issues in a way that the secular community sometimes. But is they don't do the like this. Well, let me finish the sentence, okay? Um, the Ethiopians do it like this. Uh, in fact, there's a wonderful film that was made by a student, an Ethiopian girl, who found the Samaritans and essentially did the non-Yiddish version of Lansman because they're there. They're, Nida and Samaritan Nida look so much the same. Um, you know, how different communities, when I've shown this to Protestant groups, it's been like, like, what's that? A and everyone responds in such different ways because we all live that part, the, that essential human part of our, our lives in different ways for the, um, in different ways. We have time for one more question. Here, there's a microphone coming. No, we're recording. Uh, just to build on that question, the impression from the film I had was of a kind of um, sinuous that's very, not what I would have expected in, in an Orthodox or traditional community. A lot, you know, the weddings didn't seem to be particularly separated. There was a lot of, you obviously had a lot of access to, to women uh, in ways that I wouldn't have expected, yet this prior discussion is all about a very traditional form of observance. Is that just a function of the way you filmed it, or is that a function of the way the community feels about itself, that the gender roles are not as? Uh, um, you can't take the rules of Orthodox Jews, which have been become stricter in recent centuries, you know, or even in recent decades, and in recent months. Um, you can't take those rules as the given um, you look at different, you look at Jewish communities from Iraq or from North Africa or from Yemen, and they're real different from Eastern Europe. And, and look, if you take a look at the Samaritans and compare them to Jews from, oh, let me think, from uh, Syria, when they were still in Syria, you'll find more similarities than you will to my family from Lithuania, more to his family in Iraq. And so it's just different. In other words, the standard that we start with has to be different. And, and again, this is the mirror universe. It feels really similar and that we really understand it un until we don't. Thank you so much to Helen, Professor Fine, Moshe Thank for you. coming. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Helen. What Thank a treat much. to have them in person.
Um, our screen, our festival continues in person through Thursday. Please join us. And um, the virtual festival is continuing through the 13th, including the film you just saw tonight. So if you've enjoyed it, please spread the word. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.